It's actually a pleasure to see so many people up here at 9 a.m., so thank you for coming on time. We're going to get started. It's exactly 9, and we have a record of starting all our conferences on time. So with that, I'm going to invite uh, Chris, who is the executive director of the jQuery Foundation. Uh, thank you for supporting this conference and coming over here. Over to you, Chris. All right. Yeah, so good morning. Um, I am actually kind of surprised. So I usually start my day at like 6 o'clock, right? Um, this feels really early, and it's only 9. Hi. All right. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the jQuery Foundation um, and some of the things we do, some of our projects, um, and just kind of give like a really high level uh, view of kind of what goes on at the foundation. Um, not going to get too technical on you this early, so um, hopefully it'll still be interesting, um, some good information, hopefully some things that you don't know uh, about what we do. Um, specifically, uh, like the title of the talk said, is that the jQuery Foundation itself is about a lot more than just jQuery. Um, jQuery is obviously a big part of it. It's the sort of the namesake of the foundation. Um, it's really important to the web, but we do a lot more than that, and so that's kind of the stuff that that I want to talk about today. Um, this is just a little bit about me and how you can get a hold of me. So uh, I'm pretty much, uh, I'm Cave Orchers pretty much everywhere. Um, so you can always reach out to me there. Uh, that's my email. Uh, so feel free to, to shoot me an email if you have questions or just want to talk about some of our projects or if your organization's interested in getting involved in the foundation somehow. Um, I'd be more than happy to talk to you, so feel free to reach out. Um, I guess a little bit of quick background about me. I'm uh, <coughs> uh, sort of a self-taught web developer. I do have a computer science degree, but um, learned the web myself. Um, most recently, I worked at uh, Red Hat before I started working for uh, the jQuery Foundation, and before anybody gets excited that I might know anything about Linux or Java, I don't. Um, <laughs> I was actually a JavaScript lead on one of their mobile projects. So uh, my, any technical knowledge I have is, is mostly on the client side. So, um, But yeah, so now I run, uh, I'm the executive director of the Jake Foundation, so I run kind of the day-to-day -day, uh, business side of things. So I'm um, doing a lot of uh, outreach and, and marketing type stuff and fundraising and um, things like that. So don't get to really write a lot of code anymore, um, which is still fine. I enjoy what I do. So. Uh, with that, let's actually get into uh, some content. So where I wanted to start is kind of w what we're doing now and talk about our projects, um, uh, kind of give you an update on each of our projects. Uh, there may be some projects you haven't heard of or, or projects you didn't realize were part of the jQuery Foundation. Um, so I wanted to go through that and then talk a little bit about, a little high level about um, where the foundation um, is trying to go uh, in the future. So um, the foundation itself, for those that aren't aware, is a, a member-supported nonprofit organization. Um, this is just a few of our members uh, that I wanted to call out because I figured it was names that most of you would recognize. Um, WordPress, IBM, and Famous are our uh, top-level members, um, so they, they uh, have committed a, a good amount of funding for the foundation. Um, and they help us on a lot of different uh, issues and projects. Um, but organizations uh, don't necessarily have to support us by funding. They also support us through services. So MaxCDN um, provides uh, all of our uh, CDN needs for free. So if you've ever used jQuery from code.jQuery.com uh, from the CDN, um, that's being provided by MaxCDN. Um, Organizations also uh, help us out with uh, developer needs. So if we have projects that need help, uh, need contributors, uh, organizations will occasionally just donate developer time um, to help us work on our projects as well. So um, there's a lot more, like I said, there's a lot more uh, members that actually support the foundation. Um, and you can see those on the website. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the projects. <clears throat> so, projects, um, 
uh, come to the foundation um, for, for a number of different reasons. Um, but what we provide is, is sort of uh, this high-level governance. Um, we don't get involved in any of their technical decisions. Um, we are there to uh, sort of be a neutral place uh, to hold uh, copyright for a project. So if a project um, is uh, uh, held by an individual or by an organization, it, sometimes it's hard for, for larger companies, like say like IBM, to um, be able to build product on top of that because they, don't, they can't count on it being there. But once a project comes into the foundation, that's one of the things that, that we kind of guarantee is that um, a project that's in the jQuery foundation, as long as it's viable, will always be open source, it'll always be free to use. Um, and so that's, that's one of the big reasons why a project would want to join uh, the foundation. We also provide um, for some of the common needs that a lot of projects have. So we have a foundation-wide contributor license agreement, the CLA. Um, and so that just protects a project so that when someone makes a contribution, um, they are, are uh, giving us a license to use that contribution and, and verifying that they actually uh, own that contribution and can give that contribution to us. Uh, we also provide for infrastructure needs for projects. So when a project needs uh, a website or uh, server space for continuous integration or, or build processes, things like that. We can provide that to projects. Um, we provide for legal needs, so um, advice on licensing um, and other uh, different legal issues that come up uh, when running open source projects. Um, we provide marketing uh, in a couple of different ways, so both in terms of, of making people aware of projects so that, um, that they'll go out and use them, and also marketing to uh, developers to try to get them involved uh, in our projects and help out with the projects. So, um, and then we occasionally provide financial support to projects as well. So if a project is nearing a, a major milestone um, and they just can't uh, kind of get over the hump uh, with volunteers, we may um, budget a little bit of money to, to bring in a, a contractor to to help them kind of get through a, a particular uh, issue or something that they're trying to work on. So with that, um, after I kind of made a big deal about this being about um, more than just jQuery, let's talk about jQuery. Uh -huh. So obviously jQuery is, is still an important project. It's a very important project. Um, and this is a, uh, an image that I like to use in Every time I give a talk like this, um, we go out and get some updated statistics um, just to kind of give, people, give people an idea of the popularity of jQuery. So um, if you can see, uh, so according to builtwith.com, um, out of the top million websites in the world, almost 64% of them use jQuery. Um, and even if you go and look at what they call the entire internet, which is about 328.8 million websites, 16.5% of those use jQuery. So there are occasionally things pop up that articles pop up saying you might not need jQuery. And that's true. There are instances where you may not need jQuery. Um, but obviously, a lot of people still do. So, um, and so we are going to be there to support that project um, for the foreseeable future because it's still a very important part of the entire web. And so if, if you hadn't already seen, uh, last week uh, the jQuery team released the uh, uh, 3.0 alpha version uh, release. And <clears throat> they've done a lot of stuff uh, focused on improving performance in jQuery. Um, a lot of times when people see that major version bump, they expect like big, awesome new features um, and things like that. And that's not necessarily the case with this. Um, what there are, uh, some of the changes in this release are some breaking changes. And so that's what uh, kind of justifies that bump to a new major version from two to three. Um, just a couple examples of some changes, some important changes. There was a, a major simplification of how the show and hide methods work. Um, before, there was, there was a lot of code in there trying to catch different edge cases and things, and it really, really hurt performance. 
um, and really just did a lot of weird stuff. And it was, it was kind of a rabbit hole that we were just going to have to keep going down. So the team took a step back and said, we're going to simplify this. And it may break some people's code. And so they're going to, what we ask and why we're including this in this alpha release is that you go out and try this with your projects and let us know if, it, if we're breaking things that you weren't expecting to be broken um, so that we can get those fixed for the final release. Um, another big thing is that the jQuery.deferred is now promises A plus and uh, ES 2015 promises compliant. Um, so that's a big thing. So now when you're using promises with jQuery, um, the jQuery deferred isn't a slightly different type of promise. Um, they're compatible now. And animations in jQuery, uh, we finally moved those to start using request animation frame. Um, so that definitely improves performance, smooths out those animations, um, saves battery power on mobile devices, uh, all of those types of things. And there's a whole bunch more um, going on uh, in this release of jQuery, so I would recommend checking out uh, the jQuery blog uh, to get more information about that. All right, jQuery UI. Uh, so jQuery UI uh, has recently been working on um, making their build smaller. So for a long time now, you've been able to do custom builds with jQuery UI. And that's one of the biggest complaints people have is, oh, jQuery UI is so big. But you can actually do custom builds to only grab the pieces you need. Um, and they're actually working on doing some optimization to, to make those builds even smaller. Um, so that's a good thing. Um, they're also adding in uh, support for pointer events, which I'll talk a little bit more about that when I get to another project of ours. Um, but basically, pointer events is a new specification that unifies uh, touch, mouse, stylus, really any pointer input uh, event um, so that you don't um, have to manage both of those. Um, and it gives better touch support than to jQuery UI without having to use um, uh, separate plugins. All right, jQuery Mobile. So Mobile is rewriting uh, many of their widgets um, to to be shared with their jQuery UI equivalent. Um, they're also working on better modularizing the library. Um, and they're adding this uh, classes option, which is also uh, being added to jQuery UI, um, which uh, provides the ability to uh, custom, makes it more, more easily customizable and themable. Um, so uh, there are some examples out there that uh, Alex Schmitz has built, who's the lead for jQuery Mobile. Um, I saw an example he made a while back uh, where he had a <coughs> uh, bootstrap theme working on uh, jQuery UI. Um, so it's, a, it's pretty cool. Um, and then the idea of a lot of this is that the end goal is for jQuery Mobile and jQuery UI to eventually, um, for the most part, uh, merge into a single project that will be uh, a responsive uh, UI framework. All right, Sizzle. How many people are familiar with Sizzle? Okay, just a few. So you're actually familiar with it and you don't realize it. So C Sizzle is actually the CSS selector engine that we use inside of jQuery. So that's what gives you that ability to use CSS selectors to navigate the DOM in jQuery. But it's also its own project, and you can use it outside of jQuery if you want. Um, Sizzle is actually pretty stable. Uh, they haven't been doing uh, too much. Uh, their last release, I think, was back in like March or April. Um, it's a pretty stable project, so not a ton to update on that. But it's also it's always good to to make people aware that it is its own project um, and it can be used outside of jQuery. All right, QUnit. How many people use QUnit? Not many. All right. Uh, so QUnit is a JavaScript unit testing framework. Um, there's a bunch of them out there, right? Mocha, Intern. Um, there's a whole bunch, um, but QUnit is the one currently in, in the jQuery Foundation. Um, it's a great unit testing library. Um, the jQuery projects use them, so jQuery Core, UI, Mobile, um, they all use QUnit. Um, and one of the main things they're working on right now is, is more of a 
uh, a higher level thing that's not necessarily uh, just about QUnit, and that's uh, creating this thing called this common reporter interface. Um, and so it's really cool. They're, they've been working with some of the other unit testing frameworks and other people interested in this space to figure out a way for all of these unit testing frameworks to generate a common uh, set of uh, events and outputs so that your, your test runners, um, like Karma or, um, or like even like browser stack or whatever, can um, all depend on the output to be the same no matter what unit testing framework you're using, um, which really simplifies uh, the ability to unit test uh, with, with any of these frameworks. So, so they've been working uh, more in the testing space as a whole rather than just on their own project, um, which is also really cool. All right, Pep. So Pep is really close to having a logo, but it's not official, so unfortunately I couldn't put up here. It's really cool looking, but it's not official, so. They are discussing it in an issue, though, so if you want to see where it's at, you can look at their project. Um, but Pep is a pointer event polyfill. Um, so this goes back to what I was talking with uh, jQuery UI and uh, implementing pointer events. Um, so uh, Pep was originally written by uh, some folks at Google, uh, and they donated it to the foundation, and we took it over. Um, and basically, it's a, it is a polyfill for the pointer event specification. Um, which we are big fans of. Uh, anything that can help developers have write less code. So uh, basically it gives you the ability that you don't have to fork your logic to handle touch events and mouse events. Um, it's, it's a single event system um, that handles both. Uh, and so PEP is the polyfill for that. Uh, so as browsers start implementing it, then you wouldn't need the polyfill anymore. But uh, until then, uh, PEP is a really important project to get people using pointer events now. Um, and that's jQuery UI will be using uh, PEP to implement pointer events until all of the browsers implement it. All right, Chassis. So Chassis is a, a new project uh, created at the jQuery Foundation. Um, and I like to kind of refer to it as, as a framework for CSS frameworks. Um, but it is itself a CSS framework. Uh, basically, what they are working on is trying to find, uh, trying to define a common base for uh, CSS frameworks to kind of build off of. So um, the idea there being that um, with this common base, it makes it a lot easier for your code to be portable between things like Bootstrap and Zurb Foundation or any other um, uh, CSS framework out there if, if they were all to start building on top of this base. Um, and so they're hoping to have uh, their initial CSS framework out um, in the next couple of months, I believe. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a really cool project. It's really early. So if, if you're looking to get involved in open source and you're interested in CSS frameworks, this is definitely one to jump on because you can be involved from the beginning uh, and really dive in and start contributing. All right, Esprima. Who's familiar with Esprima? Okay, not many. That's, that's okay. Um, so Esprima is a recent addition to the jQuery Foundation. Uh, it just joined the foundation in January. Um, and Esprima is a, a JavaScript parser. Um, and so what it does is it, it parses JavaScript and creates what's called an abstract syntax tree, or AST. Um, and then different uh, tools, uh, et cetera, can use that AST to understand what's going on in your JavaScript. Um, and so uh, it's a really cool project. Um, it's a really important project. There's a lot of tools built on top of that that I'll touch on in just a second. Um, currently, the Esprima team is is working on uh, implementing all of uh, the ES 2015, ES 6, whatever you want to call it, uh, features um, so that it's able to parse uh, any uh, ES 6 code. And um, they've also recently, yeah. Mm. 
So I'm going to talk about one, um, and I don't know if it's the, that's the one you're thinking of, but Structured JS is the tool that Khan Academy uses. Um, but I, I think the answer is yes. <laughs> uh, and I'll talk about one in, in just a second. Um, it, it's, it's not necessarily an, uh, a full editor, but um, I'll explain it in just a second. Uh, uh, but they also just recently improved their, uh, their testing infrastructure and their workflow uh, to make it a lot easier to contribute to that project. Before it was, um, it was basically run by one person, and if, if he didn't have time to work on it, it would kind of be stalled. And one of the things that we really had them focus on when they came into the foundation was improving those workflows and that infrastructure to make it a lot easier for other people to get involved and help out, and that's really gotten the project moving again. So uh, these are just a couple of tools that are built on uh, Esprima or, or the AST uh, that that Esprima generates. Um, Istanbul, I don't know if, if people are familiar with that project, but it's a code coverage tool. Um, so what it does is it takes, it takes your code and your tests and parses them and then determines how much of your code is covered by your tests and then can report back to you what's not covered uh, so that you can write more tests or better tests to cover all of your code. Uh, JSCS is a JavaScript code style tool uh, and so that uses uh, Esprima as well, and what that does is it analyzes your code uh, based on uh, style guides that you input into it, um, and there is a jQuery style guide um, that you can use out of the box uh, from that project, um, and so basically what that does is for your JavaScript projects, if you have a particular way you want the JavaScript written, including white space and whether or not the curly brace goes down to the next line, all of those details, um, JSCS will check those for you and then report back and say, oh, this doesn't match your style guide and you need to fix them. And so then back to the question about if there are any uh, JavaScript editors that use Esprima. So structured JS um, is really cool. I actually just learned about this a couple days ago. Um, I was watching a talk from like April that John Resig gave. Um, John's the creator of jQuery and he works for Khan Academy now, um, and Khan Academy teaches uh, their computer science curriculum with JavaScript, which is awesome. Uh, there are millions of people learning uh, how, to, how to code, how to write programs, uh, computer science concepts with JavaScript, which is amazing. Um, but this tool that they built, uh, so all of their courses are online, and they have exercises within these lessons that the students have to complete. And as they're writing code, this project, Structured JS, parses their code and compares it to a template that they provide for that lesson saying, this is what the code should look like. And then it can compare that on the fly as the student is typing and say, oh, you, you put this line here and maybe it should go above this line or you passed two uh, arguments to this function call, but it actually needs three. Um, so it can guide the student through the lesson as they are, as they are writing the code um, automatically, which is just amazing. Um, and that's built on top of uh, Esprima. And there's a number of other tools. There's a lot of tools out there that use, that use Esprima uh, under the hood. One other quick thing uh, related to Esprima is this, uh, this uh, project or, or sort of concept of ESTree, which, um, so the, the AST, the abstract syntax tree that Esprima generates, um, people have, have started, as JavaScript evolves as a language, um, they have noticed some uh, shortfalls or or, or things that uh, don't quite fit into the current abstract syntax tree that, that these parsers are using. And so a number of the other uh, JavaScript parsing tools and people that are interested in this space have started getting together uh, and working on this concept of ESTree, which is a new uh, uh, abstract syntax tree. Um, and so if that's something that interests you, like 
the nuts and bolts of JavaScript and, and how it works, I would say definitely check that out. All right, so the last project I want to talk about, uh, the last jQuery Foundation project currently is Globalize. Uh, I'll ask the question one more time. Has anybody used Globalize or at least know what it is? Nobody. Wow. Well, that's good because I think, you, I think you'll really like it. This is one of, uh, right now, this is one of my favorite projects. I love this project. Um, it's gaining a lot of steam. Um, but basically, Globalize is our internationalization and localization library. Um, so it does things like uh, parsing and formatting of dates, times, currencies, uh, numbers. Um, it will do uh, message formatting. So it will uh, do translation. If you provide a set of translations to it, it will do gender inflection, pluralization. Um, it's an amazing project. Uh, and it's all... It's all been recently rebuilt. Uh, Raphael, the project lead for Globalize, uh, and some others recently rebuilt it. It's been around for quite a while, but they recently rebuilt it on top of Unicode's uh, Common Locale Data Repository, CLDR, um, which is a huge repository of all of that information uh, that you need for the different languages and locales to format numbers and currencies and dates and times, et cetera. Um, and so it's, it's a really powerful tool, especially if you're trying to bring uh, a web application or, or a, a project to different markets where you need to format things uh, based on the locale in which the person is using uh, your application. Um, and it's all done client side. Um, so one of the things they're working on right now uh, uh, is this, this idea of this runtime optimization. So they're doing a lot of work uh, to uh, pare down the amount of code needed so that it's only uh, pulling in the pieces of CLDR you need and, the, and only pulling in the different uh, parsers and formatters that you need um, to keep the, the amount of code down and keep the uh, performance up. Um, so that's kind of what they're working on right now. Um, and then I just wanted to kind of show a quick demo. It's really ugly because I am not a designer. Um, but hopefully it gets the idea across. Hopefully you can read that. So, so this is just a, a set of different currencies. Um, and right now they're being formatted uh, based on uh, uh, US English. Um, and so 150 uh, US dollars. Um, the, the default locale just puts a dollar sign 150, a decimal point zero zero. Um, the, the other language I have in here is Brazilian Portuguese. Uh, I chose that one because Rafael, the globalized uh, project lead, is from Brazil. Um, and so he could help me make sure everything looked correct. Uh, but all I have to do, so this is a little project, I, a little add-on for React that I built. So I mean, React is obviously an overkill for what this does, but um, it's just to demonstrate. Um, so it stores the, the locale in the state. And so when I update the locale, it'll go through and update all of these React components um, to reformat them based on the locale. So if I change to Brazilian Portuguese, they all update uh, to the appropriate uh, format uh, for a currency as written in Brazilian Portuguese, uh, which is pretty cool. And this is all done client side. Um, similarly with things like dates, uh, here are a number of different formats for dates written in uh, U.S. English. And if we change them to Brazilian Portuguese, it does those translations for you. Um, all just based on that CLDR data. So, and there's, there's a bunch of other things, like here's some message formatting, and it'll do those same translations, the gender inflection. Um, you can see that it, it takes gender into account when it's, when it's uh, pointing out, um, when it's doing formatting these messages, uh, plural inflection as well, uh, where it says uh, you and to others, it does that, that pluralization for you. Um, and then numbers is, is actually very similar to what we saw above with currency. Pretty cool, right? All done on the client side, no page refresh. It's pretty cool. 
I love that project. I, I've I've been I've been really liking Globalize for a while, and and a number of other organizations are really starting to to show interest in this as well. So we've been working pretty closely with some folks at IBM, um, as well as Twitter uh, and Adobe are all uh, have then started contributing to the project and and considering using it in in some of their products, which is awesome. All right. So I have this, this new project slide in here. So, so hopefully you can see based on some of the projects that are there that it is about a lot more than just jQuery. And um, we are uh, also in the process of talking to a number of different projects about joining the foundation. Um, and one of the things that, that we wanted to make clear is that we're not trying to pick winners here. Um, so we're here to support tools that people need. So the fact that we have a Sprema doesn't mean we wouldn't bring in another JavaScript parser if a lot of people depended on it, a lot of projects depend on it, um, and need it to be around, and it fits within our mission. Um, so, and there's all kinds of examples like that, right? So, so we are just looking to support projects um, that need that support. All right, so that's, that's kind of where we're at with projects. Um, we also do a lot of work in standards bodies. Uh, so we have a, a representation in, in a number of different areas in, in standards. Um, and what we try to be is kind of the developer voice, the practitioner voice uh, in standards bodies. So a lot of times when you look at standards that are being formed, um, you will see uh, that a, a lot of times pe the, the people writing these standards are, are very academic um, or aren't necessarily in the trenches building web apps, building websites that use these standards. And so they don't fully uh, understand the impact of some of the decisions that they make. And so what we try to do is inform them of those impacts and try to, to push for standards that will help developers um, more than maybe the, the browser vendors, for example. And a good example of that is uh, pointer events. Um, and I think Scott will talk a little bit more about that later as well. Um, but we did a lot of work um, on the pointer event standard because uh, it just makes sense for developers to only have to worry about one event model for, for pointer input, right? All right. so. We do a lot of work in the W3C on standards. Uh, we are involved in all of these uh, working in community groups. Um, so everything from CSS to HTML to uh, accessibility, performance, um, touch events, pointer events. Um, we kind of have our hands all over the place when it comes to standardizing the web. So um, <clears throat> if these are things that interest you, um, we are always uh, looking for people that that are interested in standards, are are working on standards, and, and maybe don't have the ability to uh, join the W3C. Um, talk to me about that uh, because we are we're always putting people in in working groups um, to represent the developer voice uh, in these standards processes. We're also very involved in ECMA. Uh, so, uh, ECMA is obviously the, the body that, among other things, standardizes uh, ECMAScript, or what we call JavaScript, um, and that's done by the TC39 committee. Uh, we have two representatives on that committee, uh, Rick Waldron and Yehuda Katz. Um, so they, they represent the jQuery Foundation and TC39, so that gives us um, some good uh, leverage in that committee and gives us some insight into where uh, the language is headed and we can provide feedback, again, based on what, how developers use the language. Uh, another one I just wanted to call out was uh, ECMA 402, and that's the uh, internationalization uh, standard inside of JavaScript. Uh, so again, going back to my, my love affair with Globalize, um, uh, the ECMA 402 standard, so uh, Rick Waldron is actually the editor on the second edition of that, which was just started. Um, and Rafael, the, the globalized project lead, he is also contributing to that, uh, that standard as well and bringing 
some of his experiences, um, and even proposing some of the features he's built into Globalize, um, trying to bring those to the language itself um, so that JavaScript can just do some of that stuff for you. <clears throat> the other kind of big thing that we're obviously involved in are, are events all around the world. Um, so the jQuery Foundation ourselves, we run um, usually one or two events uh, in, the, in the United States. Um, but then uh, different organizations either approach us or we approach them uh, to try to, to spread our reach around the world, obviously, to an event like this. Um, and so I wanted to take this moment, actually, real quick to just uh, thank Naresh uh, and, and the committee that has helped you um, to, to put on this event. It's been awesome so far. I don't know how many of you were here for uh, the workshops or yesterday. Um, and then we've got two more days. Um, but it's been, it's been great. Um, so if we could all give uh, Naresh a hand, I'd appreciate it. So yeah, it's, I mean, without people like, like Naresh and, and the other organizations that run our events in other countries, um, we wouldn't be able to do that. Uh, we just, at this point in time, don't have um, either the, the, the person power or, or the knowledge of the market to be able to, to go and run an event um, in, in other places. So, uh, so that's just awesome that, that the community steps up and does that for us. All right, so, so that was, was basically where we're at now. Um, I kind of want to go into some, some higher level stuff about where we're headed. Um, it's, it's a little more philosophical, uh, and uh, hopefully it will it'll peak, peak some interest. Um, so last month, we had, um, the foundation had our board of directors meeting. Um, and leading up to that meeting and in that meeting, we kind of took a step back and took a look at what needs uh, were out there uh, in the world of the open web. Um, and we looked at the things that we had been prioritizing and we're trying to think about, are we prioritizing the right things to meet those needs? Um, and in some cases, yeah, I, I think we were. Um, in other cases, I don't think we were. And so what we're trying to do now is not necessarily change the foundation, um, but maybe course correct a little bit. Um, and, and try to meet uh, some of those needs out there that, um, that are obvious needs uh, throughout the open web um, that we think with our platform uh, being the jQuery Foundation, we can have an impact on. So like I said, we're not necessarily changing everything. We're still here for our projects. Our projects are very important. Um, in fact, we'll, our hope is to start adding more and more projects. Um, but in a way that we are supporting projects that help meet those needs that we have identified out there. So like I said, we're kind of taking a step back and looking at the bigger picture and some of the big overarching um, uh, issues and things going on. Um, and one of those is, is diversity. Um, and so we really want to try to start focusing on diversity in the world of open source. Um, there's definitely, uh, especially when you start getting into a lot of the really uh, popular projects, the really um, uh, large projects run by large organizations, if you look at the people involved in those, it, it's not a very diverse group. And we want to change that. Um, and so we've kind of identified three areas where we want to help uh, diversify the open web, uh, the first being obviously developers. So getting more developers from underrepresented groups uh, involved in open source, contributing to open source, um, and, and bringing that different point of view and those different experiences to open source. Uh, the second is even within the foundation diversifying our projects. So um, <coughs> right now most of our projects are focused on like uh, JavaScript or CSS, 
Um, there's no reason why we couldn't bring in a hardware project, for example. Um, but by diversifying the people involved in the organization, we can then get all of those different point of views that we don't have in our little circle, right? Um, and then at the top level, at the governance of the jQuery Foundation, um, we will admit if, if we take a step back and look at ourselves, the people that run this foundation, it's not a very diverse group. And so we've started reaching out to uh, different diversity uh, experts that, that work in this space that represent uh, different groups to help us uh, both be receptive to, to uh, the needs of these groups and also actually change the composition uh, over time of the actual group that is running the jQuery Foundation to be a more diverse and more inclusive group. Somewhat related to diversity um, is accessibility. So that's another big focus point uh, that we have. And it's right in our mission, right? The, the super short version of our mission is making the web accessible to everyone. Uh, and so we really want to start focusing on, on helping uh, in the world of accessibility, both in terms of, of tools and awareness. So whether it's uh, physical uh, disabilities or issues, cognitive disabilities, um, social or economic circumstances, uh, we want to find ways to make the web accessible to everyone. And so whether that's um, through projects, developing tools for developers to use uh, to make their applications accessible, for creating tools for the users of the web uh, to have better access. Um, and also just the idea of raising the awareness and making sure that when developers are building projects, they have accessibility in mind from the beginning and it's not an afterthought after they've already built their project in a way that excludes uh, people from being able to use it. And so along that same line of awareness is sort of the third and final uh, big picture idea, which is education. And we're gonna really start focusing on more opportunities uh, for education, whether that's through um, developer training, getting them involved in open source, uh, uh, diversity awareness, accessibility awareness, um, all of that. It's going to be a more, uh, education is kind of a, a cross-cutting um, objective that we have now. So education will hit both of those other two main objectives plus uh, the, the way we approach uh, maintaining our projects, et cetera. Um, so <clears throat> also along those lines, as, we, as I was talking about events earlier, we're actually working on um, the planning phase of a new event. Um, it's, going, it's going to be in the US um, at first, um, but what we're hoping to do is create an event that gets some of these underrepresented groups more involved in open source and brings them together with some of these large organizations that are looking to diversify uh, their open source contributors, their workforces, uh, bring those together into these small focused events and get them working together in almost one-on-one -on -one, uh, situations uh, to really sort of get people uh, involved in open source. And the hope is that that event will then become a template that we can spread uh, everywhere across the world and start running those events um, all over the place. So, um, yeah, with that, I think I went a little fast, um, but I'm happy to uh, answer any questions. Um, I know we have another session this afternoon where uh, we'll be kind of talking and answering questions and um, stuff like that as well. So, um, but yeah, does anybody have any questions about any of that stuff or? or anything that I didn't cover that maybe you were wondering about? Uh, so, so the question was about the, the Node community, um, and, and you're asking what do I think about like just where they're headed, or? Uh, 
Okay, so, so how, how's the jQuery Foundation sort of involved in, in the Node community? Um, so uh, from a technology standpoint, I mean, we have people that, that work in Node, that, that work with Node all the time, uh, et cetera. In terms of, of the actual uh, community, the new Node Foundation, um, I actually talk with them all the time. Uh, we have very similar uh, goals. Um, so I see us working together a lot uh, on sort of unifying the, the world of JavaScript, um, both on the server and the client. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I talked to, so we actually have uh, on the new Node Foundation, um, one of the people on their board is uh, Steve Newcomb from Famous. He's also on our board. Um, so we have, we have people, there's a lot of crossover. Um, so I think we'll be working together a lot. Um, and I think they're headed in, in, in a good direction, um, bringing Node and IOJS back together um, and uh, forming the foundation so that it's, it has that open governance, that neutral governance. Um, I think they're headed in a good direction and I think, I think we'll be doing a lot of good things together. Yes. <laughs> uh, that, I don't know. Do you know anything about jQuery Mobile 2.0? <laughs> so I guess the answer, so the question was if, if there was a, a timeline for jQuery 2.0. Um, for the most part, the, the jQuery projects don't uh, give public timelines um, because uh, they de depend on volunteers. And so it's very hard to keep volunteers to a specific time. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I, I assume 2.0 happens with the merge, right? Once that's done. So it may still be a while. Um, Um, I don't, I, I don't think we had, so the question was, are we going to uh, either create or support um, tools for hybrid development uh, with jQuery Mobile? So I assume with like Cordova or PhoneGap. Um, I know we don't have any plan of creating a tool ourselves unless Alex is working on something I don't know about. Um, I don't see why we couldn't support uh, a tool out there. Um, but they would need to be interested in joining the foundation. Okay. <laughs> in what capacity? So, so Scott, Scott over here, the jQuery UI lead. Um, So for those that, that couldn't hear, so the, the, the shortened version of that is that um, the UI and mobile teams, I assume, have been working with Intel um, on uh, what they're doing with their SDK. Um, uh, and they are moving to, uh, to just jQuery mobile uh, as the, the solution within the SDK. Um, and so that's a tool you can use. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, if at some point they came to us, we might have a conversation about it being a foundation project. I don't know if they would ever do that. Um, right. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but yeah, there's, no, there's definitely no plan for us to create a tool. Okay. Yes. Uh, 
And I'm just interested to know if you're targeting people in schools, because I know a lot of people that would have a lot of fun working with this kind of stuff. Absolutely. So, so yes, um, uh, when, we, when we say underrepresented groups, um, that includes age. Uh, so these events, that, that event that I was talking about where we're trying to start getting more under, uh, underrepresented groups involved, um, we're, we're doing them on the weekends, uh, so it won't interfere with school, it won't interfere with work. Um, and uh, like I said, we're trying to partner with groups so we could, uh, maybe one of the groups that we partner with are uh, universities or, or, or different uh, um, uh, programming clubs or, or anything like that where, where students may be involved. Um, I know one of the, the groups we're talking about right now is um, uh, Women of Color in Tech Chat. Um, so they, uh, they are uh, really interested in working with us. Um, uh, but yeah, definitely age is, age is uh, definitely uh, an important factor as well. And so um, we definitely want to get students involved because yeah, the earlier you can get involved in open source, uh, the more doors I think that opens uh, for you career-wise, definitely. Anybody else? Yes. Um, I mean, I think, I think the easy answer to that is funding. Uh, so finding organizations um, uh, that are willing to, to keep us running. Um, because it does, a lot, of, a lot of times people don't realize that, especially once we get to an organization of this size with this many projects, it actually takes quite a bit of money to keep it running. Um, open source is free. <laughs> Uh, but a lot of money usually goes into actually uh, keeping it running. Um, so that's definitely a big challenge. Um, I think one of our other big challenges are the things I was talking about at the end, is, is really trying to, to diversify uh, what we're doing, who's involved, um, and so that's, that's why we're really trying to focus on that. Yeah. Yes? Yeah, can you elaborate on the infrastructure and security? The internet is running on jQuery, so how we secure? Uh, I'm not sure. So in terms of like the security of jQuery itself? The servers uh, would. Oh, OK. Um, so we have, we have an infrastructure team um, that, that tries to manage that. Um, you may have noticed, I forget, when was that? Last summer? Last summer? Um, we had a pretty, pretty big uh, incident where our, our websites uh, were defaced, um, and we were being um, uh, DDoSed, like some of the largest DDoSes that our hosts have ever seen, um, uh, to the point where it was actually bringing down their internal network, and their uh, internet provider was shutting them off. <laughs> Um, so uh, we've started, we've, we're always looking for help there. So if that's something you're interested in, we are always looking for help on the infrastructure team. Um, Cloudflare uh, did help us out. They stepped in and, and gave us their service for free, um, which is awesome. Uh, so that helped mitigate a lot of that, the DDoS issues that we have. We haven't really seen those anymore. Um, I mean, we're still, we're still actually being DDoS all the time, um, but Cloudflare uh, fixes that for us. Um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely a challenge, especially for, like I said, for uh, an organization, a nonprofit organization that doesn't have a huge security team. I mean, we have maybe uh, three people or so that, that work on infrastructure a lot, and then maybe a couple more that help out occasionally. Um, and, and yeah, they're managing, I don't even know, it's something like 20 or 30 servers and, and all kinds of infrastructure. So we're always looking for help. So if that's something you're interested in, we should talk. <laughs> yeah. So 
standards. Yeah, so we are so we are members of the W3C, um, and so uh, we are able to uh, put representatives in working groups and things like that to that define the standards. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so you might talk to Chrome, Safari, and you know Firefox teams as well to push in more features. So, I just want to know that how reluctant they are, or how you know easy, how easy it is to talk to each one of them because they own their proprietary browsers, and who is more open to new ideas and who is not. So, I don't want to get in trouble. <laughs> um, for the most part, the browsers are, are willing to at least discuss things. Okay. Um, that doesn't mean that they will immediately change their mind. Okay. Um, historically, Safari has been really fun to try to talk to um, about different things, especially around uh, pointer events. Um, and Scott will talk a little bit about that as well later. Okay. Um, but in general, I mean, in general, the, the, the browser vendors, uh, we have a good relationship with them. Uh, we talk to them a lot because we get a lot of bug reports that are actually browser bugs. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have relationships with them um, uh, where we can kind of fast track uh, bugs uh, for them to fix. Um, but yeah, it, it, as far as implementing new standards, I mean, it's a little bit of work. Um, but like I said, uh, there most of them are at least willing to have the discussion, mm -hmm. um, and if it makes sense, uh, they usually come around. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah, so uh, again, I, I'm, I don't really get to uh, work on the projects as much. So the question was if I could elaborate a little bit on, on uh, chassis and how it might relate to a project like Bootstrap. Um, our, I, our goal, our idea is for chassis to kind of be this very um, generic base uh, CSS framework that other projects could build on top of. And we actually have, so uh, I, his name's Chris, I can't think of his last name, uh, who's on the Bootstrap team. He's actually contributing a lot to Chassis. Um, we've had conversations with the folks at Zurb uh, that run Foundation. Um, and we're trying to find, if, if you look at a lot of these CSS frameworks, they do a lot of things the same way. Um, and a lot of times the difference is like the class names, which is just a headache when you try to move from one to another. Um, and so that's what we're hoping Chassis can kind of help them avoid if, if they're willing to, to move their framework on top of it. Does that make sense? Yeah, so that, so the classes option, um, which, is that in a release yet, Scott? Classes option for UI? Okay, so soon. Okay, so very soon, 112, jQuery UI 112 will have this new classes option. And you can uh, map the bootstrap classes to, to the UI classes um, the way that you want them. So then you will easily, pretty easily, be able to theme your jQuery UI elements with a, boot, a bootstrap theme. Cool. Well, I think that'll do it. So thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>